Hey everyone, my name is Lee Robinson and welcome to today's live stream AMA on Next.js and Vercel. Today I'm gonna to be answering any questions that you have related to Next.js, Vercel, React Server components, pretty much whatever you want. And first, before we get started, I'm just gonna give you a little background on myself. So my name is Lee Robinson. I'm a solution architect at Vercel. And really what that means is I help out customers who are getting on the Vercel platform and I also help grow and educate the Next.js community. Um, yeah, so we were able to put out a thread on Twitter and ask people to send in some questions ahead of time. So the way this is gonna work is I have a list of questions that y'all have asked ahead of time, both on Twitter and on Discord, and I have those ready to answer. And then I'm also going to be um, checking the chat, answering some of your questions inside the chat and doing my best to answer everything as good as I can. So uh, I'll start with some easy ones and we'll see what we can get into. We have about an hour. So first up, an easy one. Does Next.js support Webpack 5 yet? So we've been working closely with the Webpack team. Um, there is currently beta support, but in the next stable release of Next.js, we're gonna have complete support for Webpack 5. And I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, another pretty easy one, which is, uh, Jesus said this, which is, what's the best way to push a route from get server side props. So this could mean a couple different things, but what I'm guessing what you're talking about is redirects. So a recent improvement to Next.js was an optional redirect value that allows you to kind of skip some of that boilerplate and easily redirect or you know push to a new route when you're on the server side. So basically you just add this redirect key inside of get server side props. Um, this is in the Next.js documentation now too as well. Uh, and that will allow you to, for example, permanent redirect or temporarily redirect to a different page. So this might be if you're trying to do like uh, authentication on the server side, for example. Uh, AMA stands for ask me anything. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, right now, I'm just answering some questions that people asked ahead of time and then I'll get to some of the ones in the chat. Uh, another question from Derek, is there a way to make subdomains work with Next.js? And I put out a blog about this that maybe somebody can link in the chat. It's uh, called Incrementally Adopting Next.js. And this goes really in depth on a few different ways that you can incrementally adopt Next.js, one of them being using subdomains. So the short summary of this is you can use either subdomains, um, subpath, or even a monorepo approach to allow you to kind of incrementally adopt Next.js in your organization. Um, somebody will put a, a link for that in the chat and that'll go way more in depth. Uh, another question, this one's pretty exciting. How would you implement feature flags at page load time? So like in a server-side rendered solution, um, the Next.js team is working on a kind of generic A-B testing solution that will just be built directly into the framework. Uh, it's still pretty early on this, but I'm excited to see this land because I know that it's a pretty common request for people trying to do you know, experiments or personalization of pages uh, at request time. So I'm excited for that. Uh, let's see, Matt asked, how might React Server Components or Next.js help teams ship UI code in a single client application? So we just released, recently released a blog post about React Server Components and included some good resources a really high level overview, as well as a video that I made that goes more in depth on how React Server Components work. And really the summary here is that React Server Components let you use the client and the server for what they're both the best at. So you can serve your presentational components from the server that might have really large dependencies like Markdown or date formatting. And then you can still serve your interactive components on the client side. So maybe a nav bar or a search input or some other you know, interactive client experience where you still wanna use React, you still wanna use JavaScript. Um, and I do think this is really gonna change how we build React applications and make it easier for teams to collaborate, make you know, better performing applications and overall just kind of a better user experience too. So I like to think of React Server Components as the, like the culmination of what the React team's been working on for three or four years. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, let's see. Regis asks, how can you send an email with a form? Um, 
Probably my favorite way to do this would be using an API route with Next.js. Now, you don't have to do it this way, um, but we'll talk about the API route first. So if you're using an API route, it essentially allows you to add bits of backend functionality to your application for things like authentication or filling out a form or you know stitching together um, different pieces of your application. And when you do this, you could do it through like a vanilla email library, or you can use, a, you're, you're probably going to use a provider like a SendGrid or a Mailgun or, or one of these third-party libraries that make it really easy. Um, another thing that you could do if you didn't want to have an API route is you could use uh, an automation, I don't know, an automation site like a Zapier or a Trade.io. And then you can kind of just hit a webhook and on their website, like on a no code side of things, you could build a workflow that would allow you to send an email or send a Slack message. Um, so there's there's a few different ways to do that. On my website, lerob.io, I have a snippets section and I have a few examples there of using SendGrid. I believe I have a Mailgun one as well too. Um, what else? What are the differences between Next Image and Gatsby Image? Um, there was also a question in Discord about blur up placeholders for loading. Um, so I'll start with kind of how they're similar and then I'll talk about how they differ a little bit. And I'm doing a talk at uh, Jamstack Toronto in a few days on the 20th. If you wanna hear more from this, it'll be myself, um, Gatsby, Netlify, Sanity, I think are all gonna be there. So that should be really exciting. Um, Basically, the difference, differences in the similarities, um, the similarities between Next Image and Gatsby Image, they can both resize and optimize. They can both lazy load by default, which is great, helps speed up your page loads. Um, they both prevent layout shift by defining what the width and height of those images are so that you don't have cumulative layout shift. Um, they both use Sharp, which is the library locally for resizing your images and doing that optimization. And they both allow you to pass in some parameter where you want to adjust the quality of those images. Now, there are some differences. Um, Gatsby's is more of a drop-in replacement for image tags. So it's optimized for kind of fixed width and height images. So next image is a little bit different. It's more of an opinionated, um, not really a drop-in for an image tag, but it's still built on just standard web technology, like using an image tag with source sets and, and opinionates all that for you so that you don't have to do any of that yourself. Um, Gatsby image uses GraphQL. Uh, next image is, isn't really opinionated on how you wanna fetch your images, whether that's local or remote images. Um, next image currently supports WebP, but uh, Gatsby image is adding this pretty soon, I believe with their V2. Um, same with, uh, AVIF, I don't, I don't know if you pronounce it like an acronym, like A-V-I-F or VIF or AVIF, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Next Image and Gatsby are gonna be both adding support for that. Um, Next Image currently doesn't have blur up placeholders, which is one thing that Gatsby Image has, but we're working on an RFC that is going to allow blur hash or blur up placeholders, uh, as well as prevent you from having to always specify the widths and heights of images. So we're gonna have some solution that will allow you that you don't have to do that unless you're fetching remote images or, or something like that. So stay tuned for some more information on there. Um, let's see, what's the best resource to get started learning Next.js? Um, I would highly recommend the official learn course. It's very thorough and it really allows you to walk through and build your own blog using Markdown, it explains things at a, a pretty high level so that you can kind of grasp all the different concepts. And then at the end of it, you also have something to show, something tangible that you've built and, and get it deployed to. So that's that's really fun. How we doing? I have a few more in here that were asked ahead of time. So for anybody, for anybody joining, uh, I'm just answering some questions ahead of time and then I'll jump into ones in the chat. So when should I use next export instead of next build? This is a common question I've heard a couple of times. So next export, exists mostly for backwards compatibility. Um, next build can do everything that next export can. Uh, and there's a lot of features that are in next build that you'll probably want to use um, like internationalization and image optimization and more. So personally, I would recommend using next build basically anywhere that can run a 
node server can run next build. And that works with zero config deployments to Vercel too, which ties into another question that we had, which was, could you provide guidance on the best practices for self-hosting? And absolutely. So this is something that I'm working on right now. Um, obviously, I work for Vercel, <laughs> so I'm biased. And I think it's the best place to deploy Next.js applications. It was designed to build and run Next.js applications. But obviously, you know that won't work for everyone. Um, and we want it to be still a great experience using Next.js. We want to provide that guidance in the documentation. So I'm going to work on some documentation talking a little bit more about self-hosting. It'll probably be Docker based with like a Docker file showing the workflow through next start so that it's usually so it's easily usable across whatever infrastructure you want to deploy to as most backend solutions have some sort of Docker based um, support. Um, that is most of the questions that I had ahead of time. So thank you all for joining. There's so many questions in the chat. Um, I will just scroll up and start grabbing some. Is there any ETA within Vercel for the release of a Shopify Next.js commerce demo? So if you haven't seen, I'm going to <laughs> try my screen sharing, see how it works. Um, if you haven't seen, we have Next.js commerce, which is a starter kit for high performance e-commerce sites. And it's got a lot of really cool stuff included. It's fast. Um, it's built on all the best Next.js features. And right now it works with Big Commerce. So, you know, if you got here, you can try it out. Uh, and it works with Big Commerce, but we want to add support for a bunch more e-commerce providers. And the next up is Shopify. So we are targeting support by the end of the month. Early February is kind of what we're thinking. Um, pretty excited for that. Hopefully that'll be coming really, really soon. Hi to everyone saying hi in the chat. Um, let's see. Am I doing anything wrong if I'm treating ISR as throttled SSR? Um, not necessarily. So the way I like to think about it is one of the big benefits of doing ISR, which is incremental static regeneration. I know there's a lot of acronyms, so. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, and what incremental static regeneration is, it basically allows you to still serve up a static site when you have a lot of dynamic content without having to do a full rebuild of your application. So just to do a like a quick recap of all the different ways you can render and you know, leave a comment in the chat if you want me to go more in depth on these, but you have client side rendering, which is like a traditional React application, server side rendering, which is how Next.js started, um, basically on every page request, you're getting unique HTML. Um, you have static site generation, which has been around for a while with things like Hugo and Jekyll, but um, basically you're generating these HTML files ahead of time. But then you also have incremental static regeneration, which is a Next.js specific thing. And it's kind of a merger of static site generation and um, server side rendering. So. You're not, um, you're not doing anything wrong. The way I like to think about it is with ISR, you're guaranteed that the first hit of your application is never down because it's always static. So regardless of if your <laughs> database goes down or somebody you know, tries to take down your website or something like that, the first person going to your website, they're always going to see that static content. And you know, if your site is truly down, somebody took down your database, what happens is ISR, when it goes to try to fetch that new data, if it's not successful, it won't purge the cache, which means that you're never not gonna show a page. You're never gonna show a broken page. So you're always having uptime, you're always showing at least something. And the, on the inverse, if you were doing server-side rendering and your database was down, uh, then you're, <laughs> you're not gonna have a good time, basically. Um, welcome, everyone. How is it working at Vercel? Um, I've been at Vercel for five, five or six months now, and it's been great. I was a member of the Next.js community and the React community for a few years before joining Vercel and was just really interested in this space. 
mostly for my own personal curiosity. I've I've loved using React for a long time, and Next.js kind of simplified a lot of the things that I didn't like doing about React applications, basically. It made it really easy, and I, I really enjoyed working with Vercel and deploying the Vercel platform, so I used it for pretty much all my projects. So it was actually a pretty natural fit for me to come work with the Vercel team. And I think my favorite part about working at Vercel is there's a lot of really smart people and they all are kind of aligned on the same mission, which is great. So whether it's people in engineering or people in design, people on support, people in management, all the way from the top down from the CEO, uh, everybody is really, you know, they can all ship. They can all like, we have designers who can code. We have coders who can design. It's, it's great. Um, find some more questions. Is it better to have different code bases for the landing page, blog, app, or admin, or should everything live in the same code base when using Next.js? So you can actually do this all from within the same code base. And typically this is probably the preferred way to do it. Um, I'll throw a classic, it depends in here because it does depend on how many people are working on your application. For example, if you have like a massive application and you have lots and lots of things going on in one repo, AKA like a mono repo, for some teams, that's just not the preferred workflow that they like. Um, you know, too many PRs, too many merge conflicts, you know, but for a lot of teams, you know, individuals, smaller teams, this can be great because there's less context switching between different repos. And when you're working locally, you can do next dev and everything just kind of works together. There's not separate projects that you have to like, you know, I have the blog running on localhost 3000. I got the main app running on 3001. You don't have to like stitch them together or anything like that. So in general, I would say I would recommend doing that. Got my for sale mug. Uh, is <laughs> is twenty twenty one the year of next JS? That's a great question. I don't know. Uh, hopefully, I mean, we'll see. I think that uh, it's been really exciting to see the growth. I think that a lot of people have realized that there's parts of building React applications that they just don't want to do themselves, and they'd rather lean on an open source library that's had these problems solved, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. So I, I do think a lot of people will be checking out or just at least exploring with Next.js in 2021. Which library do you prefer when dealing with GraphQL in Next.js? So <laughs> I sometimes I I hate to, I don't want to talk bad about a library, but whenever I have used a library and have had a bad experience, it's hard for me to recommend it. So I've personally had a bad experience with Apollo Client in the past. It could be a lot better since the last time I've used it, but I struggled a lot with managing the cache in Apollo Client. So I I kind of moved away from using that. Feel free to leave a comment if you know there's a new caching support that's way better and I need to I recheck it out. Um, and after that, I started to use GraphQL requests, which is a really thin, wrapper around fetch. I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's Formidable Labs who makes that, I can't remember, but um, it works really good. Um, you can always do just like vanilla GraphQL queries in a fetch, but GraphQL request was like just enough abstraction to, to help me out with that. Um, and then for handling the caching, I like to use SWR, swr.vercel.app if you wanna learn more about that. Uh, it's similar to React Query, if you've heard about that. Um, Discord. Yeah, we have a Next.js Discord at nextjs.org slash Discord. Feel free to jump in there, ask questions. I'm in there answering questions all the time. You can DM me directly if you'd like. Could you point me to any resources to get better with Figma? I have a solid skill set with Next.js, but my UIs don't look as professional as apps you've built in your streams. Thanks. Um, first off, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. Uh, this is hard. This is one of the hardest parts, right? Because front-end development is already a lot. There's already so much that you have to learn. 
you're learning React, you're learning, I mean, from the start, right? HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then it's like React, Next.js. <laughs> There's so many things that you can learn, right? Accessibility. Um, and then you get to the design and you're like, crap, now I have to figure out how to make a good design. <laughs> so uh, that's part of the philosophy why we've been building starter kits at Vercel, which is just, there's a lot of people who are on this learning journey and they want to make an application that looks good and they're they're still trying to learn. They're not great at design yet, but they still want to have something that looks beautiful. Um, so the, the starter kits have helped with that. But to answer your question, I think the two best pieces of advice I can give, one is repetition. So I did not get any good at design until I spent time in back in the day in sketch a lot building things i use figma now i really love figma um so actually designing things and then actually building those things and you know if you don't have the eye for design yet i would just try to copy existing websites um that's one thing second is there's some good resources that i can point you to probably the best resource from a developer trying to learn design is refactoring ui by the creators of tailwind that book and the associated videos like blew my mind because it really helped me as a developer understand more of what the designers were looking for. So that's great. And then on my Twitter, um, on my Twitter at Lee Rob with three E's because somebody else took the, the two E one. <laughs> I just retweeted a, uh, I think it was beginner Figma or inter introduction Figma or, or uh, some website like that. That was a really great resource with just you know, I've never used Figma before and I'm trying to learn. So, so check that out as well. Jamstack Toronto for the win. Yep, I'll be there in two days on Wednesday. <laughs> the real question is, how do you go about acquiring this fine piece of clothing that you're wearing? So yeah, we have some, uh, some Next.js swag and some Vercel swag. Um, I don't know, maybe someone from Brussels will be in the chat giving away some swag. I don't know. We, we give away swag every now and then to people in the community and, um, you know, people who speak at our events and such, but yeah, it's really nice. I really, I wear black for pretty much everything. So it fits my aesthetic. <laughs> Can I have the discord link? Yep. It's just nextjs.org slash get get <laughs> GitHub. I don't want to say GitHub nextjs dot org slash discord sometimes when you talk too much your words just get all fumbled and you can't say anything <laughs> um i would like to see next.js make it more easy to use it with headless wordpress the current example got a ton of things missing yeah that's really good feedback i will make a note of this and see if we can improve that um, i'm assuming you're talking about like the blog starter example that uses headless WordPress. So I'll check that out and, and try to make that better. Sorry about that bad experience. Um, <laughs> Avif, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce that. I don't know. We're just gonna go with that. <laughs> Let's see, where are the questions being taken from here, Discord? So currently I'm just pulling questions from here. Um, so if you put one in Discord, I don't have it open right now. So feel free just to, to paste it in the YouTube chat. Images will be even better with Next.js. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, just to step back and talk about kind of the philosophy of Next Image and, and why it's a thing in the first place is the Next.js team and the Google Chrome team collaborated on this with the intention of images make up of like a lot of the web, a ridiculous amount of the web. So if we can improve the loading performance of images, we can in turn improve the performance of the web. So this is very aligned with Google Chrome's initiatives and their goals. And for them, you know, the, the best way for them to make impact at scale was to work with parties like Vercel and like Next.js where they're already established frameworks and they can put these best practices in there. And then everyone's just a, you know, an NPM yarn update away from getting all this for free. So the the missions and the goals are very aligned there. And hopefully people will enjoy using Next Image. We're gonna make it as easy as possible for you to have really performant image loading and optimization. So at the end of the day, you have really good lighthouse scores. And just a 
a tangent on this. Another reason um, why we want to do this is there is a change to Google's PageRank algorithm in, I believe, May. And it's more heavily influencing sites that have good performance. So Google's outlined these things called core web vitals. You might have heard of like time to first byte, cumulative layout shift, um, first contentful paint. And we can put a link in the chat for these. But basically, these are performance metrics that help you evaluate how real users are um, you know, viewing the performance of your site. So if you can improve these metrics, Google will say, hey, your site is a better experience for people on the web trying to view it from slower internet connections. And we're going to we're gonna reward you for that, basically. So it's important to know about these. Uh, check out nextjs.org slash analytics if you want to learn more. Um, will Next.js use Snowpack? Um, two things on this. One thing I will say is never say never, but probably not. And the reason why probably not is I think it's really easy to underestimate how big and how important Webpack is. Um, the Webpack team, they're amazing. They're incredible. They do such good work. Um, and so many companies of all sizes and scale rely on Webpack. And we've, you know, we've built Next.js on top of Webpack. Webpack 5 support, like I talked about at the beginning of this live stream, will be landing in the next stable release. And it, it's such a critical piece of the JavaScript ecosystem. Now, all these upcoming tools like a Snowpack are amazing. Uh, ES Build, all these things, so cool. Vite, there's so many, I don't even know all the names. But they're, they're amazing tools. But you have to remember that it's not as easy to just drop it into a framework like Next.js because you would break so many people who depend on Webpack or custom Webpack setups. Um, so probably not, but it's still exciting to see the innovation in the space. Oh no, I lost my scroll. <laughs> there is a lot of questions here, um, which is great. Thanks everyone for asking questions. Uh, any plans to extend Next.js to embed it better in existing sites like web components? Um, I don't have any like official plans on this or anything that I can think of, but I think this is a great idea. I think the closer we can align with the web platform, the better off we'll be. And like I talked about with Next Image, like we wanted to make sure that that was built on just HTML spec, like it's still using what the browser is expecting and what the browser supports. So it would be really cool to have better first class support for things like web components. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. Are there any component patterns that may be helpful for migrating to server components when it comes out? So I talked about what React server components are a little bit at the beginning of this. Basically, you can use the client and the server for what they're both best for. Um, this is still in the you know, RFC phase. The Facebook um, React team has this RFC open where you can check it out and learn more about it. They're still figuring some things out. It's not really ready for production usage just yet. But we're going to be working closely with the React team to add support for that into Next.js. Um, somebody can throw a demo link in the chat for the Next.js React Server Components demo. Um, and we're going to continue working with them to make that adoption pattern very seamless. As far as component patterns, uh, the way I like to think about it is if you think about like a facebook.com, right? You have on the left, you have navigation. On the middle, you have your news feed. On the right, you have like activity. Twitter's kind of like this too. So uh, patterns for server components might look like on the server, I want to serve up the things that are needing to be pre-rendered ahead of time. So rendered into HTML. So that might be the content in your newsfeed and like images. It might be um, the you know different navigation links on the side of your page, right? This is that presentational content I was talking about. But then once that content loads, you want to have these client components that allow you to do interactivity. So clicking on the like button or searching for a friend to add, those things that you still want to have that JavaScript and React on the client side, um, then you can use server components for that um, to still you know, inter intertwine those client and server components. Um, 
Let's see. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. The less Docker in my life, the better. You should check out Vercel. <laughs> it prevents you from having to worry about the Docker. I I have a, uh, you know, I think Docker is great um, because it solves a huge problem, which is like, hey, <laughs> what's that XKCD? It's just like, <laughs> I need to just ship my computer to the cloud or something like that. And that's how Docker was born. It's so true. Um, <laughs> Is making a web app fully serverless with Next.js and Vercel a good idea? I mean, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> um, yes, we. this is how we use a lot of the apps that we dog food internally. Um, dog food is, just means like you eat your own dog food, you, you try out the products that you build. Um, so like Next.js Commerce, which I talked about, the entire backend for that application uses API routes in a serverless manner. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Are there any good examples of a new Relic integration? I don't have one personally off the top of my head, but if someone has one, throw that in the chat. Um, I have some problems using Material UI and Next.js. Um, any work around for this? So I would recommend checking out the official Material UI example that's in the Next.js GitHub examples folder. If you're still having problems, feel free to DM me and I'll, I'll try to help out. This is a great question. Can you explain what the best practices are for managing connections to Postgres from serverless functions? Um, basically, th this is something I think it's really easy to get tripped up on because the concept of serverless is new for a lot of people, which is totally, totally fine. Um, from a highest level, like explain it like I'm five, serverless is basically someone else is going to manage your servers for you. It's abstracting away that infrastructure so that you don't have to worry about. It doesn't necessarily mean that there are no servers or that they've been abandoned or something like that. It's just, you know, some data center somewhere in the middle of Iowa that Amazon is taking care of or Google's taking care of, and you don't have to worry about that. You get to basically pay to rent out their infrastructure. So that's serverless. And then serverless functions are pieces of backend code that you can write with languages like Node.js that allow you to execute some logic. So you make a HTTP request to these functions and you get back a response. So it could be authentication, it could be um, persisting things to a database, all sorts of things. And there's a few best practices to think about when you're doing this so that you get good performance. So if I have my database, again, on AWS, I have a Postgres database. If I have it in the US East region, I want to also deploy my serverless functions in the US East region so that there is lower latency between those two and communicating. So if you think about it from like a world map perspective, if you're, you know, your servers are in, <laughs> if they're in US East, which is like Virginia or something, and then your serverless functions are deployed on the other side of the world, uh, it's just gonna take a while for that request. Like physically, it will take a while for that request to, to get there. So. We just, released, we just recently released um, some new UI settings on Vercel that allow you to specify which region you want. Um, so check those out. That will help you make sure that your functions are close to where your database is at. That's part one. Part two is connection pooling. And what I mean by this is, let's say that you have a really high scale website and there's thousands or tens of thousands of people who are hitting your serverless functions and trying to connect to your database. Now, you, you don't want every single function to open up a connection to your database because that wouldn't be very performant. So there are tools that do connection pooling, which essentially says if 200 people try to connect to their database at one time, it merges those, it pools them so that you're not you know, opening too many connections to the database. So there's two good ways to do this. One is using something like PG Bouncer, which is specifically for Postgres. Uh, and another is using um, basically like, I don't know how you pronounce this, like post, post rest. It's like Postgres, but rest. Um, and you're, you're just using HTTP for that. A good example of this is Supabase. Um, somebody wants to leave a link to that too. That's what they do. 
more questions. Thank you everyone for hanging out with me today and throwing some questions in the chat. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Yes, check that material UI example on GitHub. Are there, how are the discussions within the Next.js team on how to balance not bloating the framework, but still providing all the useful out of the box smart defaults? This is a very tricky problem because you wanna provide people with all the tools that they want, but at the same time, you have to be laser focused on performance and not increasing the bundle size. So, you know, if I'm using Next.js, maybe I don't want that new feature and I don't want my performance or my install time to be decreased because of it. So the team is really laser focused on this. It's kind of embedded into our DNA at Vercel. Everything we do revolves back around how will this impact performance? So a great example of this is image optimization. When we released image optimization, we had support for a handful of different loaders, which essentially is like, the services that you want to use. You want to use Cloudinary, you want to use Imagix, you want to use whatever, right? And we saw a lot of PRs for people who wanted to add more loaders. The problem is, you know, that doesn't scale very well as far as the number of JavaScript that's bundled into the Next.js library. For every loader, you're going to have more and more and more JavaScript in the Next.js package. So instead, the approach that the Next team took um, working with Google Chrome um, was to provide an option for a custom loader. So this custom loader allows you to specify what you want the URL to look like, which then makes it available for any number of loaders that you want. So a much more scalable solution that required a bit more thought and planning to get right, but doing it right not only has you know better performance for everyone else using Next.js Next and uh, keeps that DX still really high. So it's, it's really a core part of the Next.js team. Are there any recommended solutions for error logging outside of a Next.js app self-hosted? Um, for the client side, if you're trying to, well, I guess server side too, but if you're trying to catch errors and say the most popular solution is Sentry, it's open source. Um, and that's for like error tracking and monitoring. For just general, you know, did this succeed? Did it not succeed? How did, long did it take type, excuse me, logging? Um, you can do just console log in your serverless functions or your backend when you're self-hosted and you can divert those to whatever logger of choice you want, depending on your infrastructure. So I think Winston is a popular one that kind of formats things in the correct, in the right way. And then, oh man, I can't even think of what self-hosted infra is used for logging, but I know there's a few different logging tools in the Kubernetes stack of things, but that's it's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> what did I think of the recent state of JS? Um, I always take these frameworks with a grain of, or not these frameworks. I always take these surveys with a grain of salt just because it's, who knows who submitted for that, who didn't submit for that, what the demographics of that looked like, you know, who was emailed out about that. So I don't treat it as the Bible per se, um, but it's sometimes interesting just to see the growth of some of the newer tools in the space. So it was kind of fun to read about um, things like Svelte. Svelte's doing really awesome and people love using that. And some of the like ES build is super cool. I'm really excited about that. Um, but, you know, take everything with a grain of salt, basically. What is the best way to do a modal? Um, it depends on if you want to build it yourself or if you want to use a component library. So if you're already invested in a component library like a material UI or a chakra UI or or something of that effect, they probably have modals by default. If you want to build it yourself, I will <laughs> I, I would probably caution against it because doing it right requires you to have a good understanding of how to create an accessible modal. And you can absolutely go through the legwork to figure this out, but there's a few really good libraries uh, one is called Radix that has a headless modal. So I, I believe it does. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Radix has like headless UI components. Another one is Reach UI. Uh, React Aria is one from the Adobe team. 
all these libraries, Headless UI is one from the Tailwind team. There's a bunch. Um, they allow you to provide your own markup for styling, whether you want to use CSS modules or CSS and JS or whatever you want, and still get the like the the accessibility benefits of creating a proper modal. So I would recommend still using some kind of library so that you're not making a non-accessible uh, modal for your users. Uh, things did improve with Apollo Client V3, but there's still some issues uh, working with Next Router. Interesting. Yeah, I might have to check this out and just see how the the caching world has changed with Apollo. But that's good for good for me to know. Hmm. Is there a better way to deal with component styling than importing the styles as an object and applying them with a class? Um, this with the BEM style notation seems quite cluttered. So you shouldn't have to use BEM, which stands for base element modifier. It's a naming structure that was popularized in the SAS days of, well, I mean, SAS is still a thing, but it was popularized with SAS that would allow you to name your class names in a repeatable, predictable way. You shouldn't have to use this with CSS modules because the CSS file that you're importing for that component per se, it's scoped to just that component. So if you have uh, a class name wrapper or container inside of that file, you could also have one that's called container or wrapper in a different one, but it's only scoped to that specific one. So that's the huge benefit of CSS modules. Um, so that it kind of prevents you having to figure out that naming. If you want to completely get rid of naming, I would recommend Tailwind because it ships with utility classes that once you figure out those utility classes, then you don't have to worry about naming anything ever. You just stitch together utility classes. So I've enjoyed using Tailwind. More questions. I infrequently use an app that has pages behind get server side props. I find that those pages are slow on Vercel. Is this cold start latency? Are low user apps better on a node server? So it's likely due to what I talked about earlier, which is optimizing your serverless functions for performance. So just a quick summary of that was make sure that your database or your data store is located close to your functions in the same region, ideally, and make sure that you know, you're using something like connection pooling if you have a lot of users or something like Supabase if you want to do HTTP for that. Um, but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be an issue. Feel free to DM me if you're you're still seeing trouble with that. <laughs> do, do you listen to C shanties? So this is like all the rage right now, isn't it? Uh, all the people on TikTok are going crazy for the C shanties. Um, they do they are pretty good. I'm not gonna lie. Like I I am a musical person. I got my guitar over there and my brand new record up here. I have, I have lots of records. Um, so I do really enjoy music and yeah, sea shanties, chef's kiss. Love it. How can an existing create react app incrementally adopt next GS? Any example repos? So you are in luck because I just opened up a PR yesterday, I think, uh, for I'm working on documentation for migrating from create React app and React router to Next.js. So within the next couple weeks, we'll say, I would expect that to land uh, in the Next.js documentation and provide some good guidance for, you know, if you're used to React router and you want to figure out how to do that in the Next router world, and if you're used to create React app and you want to figure out how to get that in the Next world, it's all going to be in the documentation. So stay tuned for that. Greetings from Russia. Hello. Can you please sh tell me how to structure large scale projects in terms of application, in terms of architecture and file structure from Tony Stark? <laughs> Tony Stark, the, the real deal, he's here. It's Iron Man. Um, it depends. <laughs> uh, it's funny because things like Prettier have got popular for formatting how code looks. You know, as a developer, there's this term called bike shedding, which is basically like when I'm reviewing my code, I don't want to waste time getting into arguments with people because somebody used a semicolon or somebody used tabs or spaces. 
<laughs> so you have tools like Prettier, which say, you know what, here's the standardization. This is what your code's gonna look like and we're gonna follow it. Um, we've been trying to do something like this. And by, by we, I mean, just like the community for file systems. So I think uh, Ben has a, Ben Awad has something called Destiny, which is like uh, basically prettier for file structures. I think something like that could be interesting if that ever becomes a thing. I don't know how like work in progress or if that's stable or not, but something like that would be interesting just to to manage the, the folder structure. Next is pretty unopinionated and how it does that other than, you know, you have to have a pages folder. Those are where your top level routes are. You could have a styles folder at the top level. You could have a, you'll, you'll commonly see a lib or a library folder, which is like the logic where you connect to external services. You might have a util for utilities. It's, it's really up to you. What a great segue because I needed to take a drink of water. I actually bought the book Refactoring UI last year. Thanks for the response. Yeah, Refactoring UI is great. Um, also for me too, just building off this again, following really good designers on Twitter too, or just anywhere, Dribble, uh, allows me to just kind of ingest what good design looks like and then try to figure it out. So look, luckily there's lots of great designers at Vercel too. So I get to see what they're doing and be like, oh wow, that looks really good. I should do something like that. <laughs> What do you recommend to do or learn to get more professional skills as a developer? Mastering data structures, algorithms, something specific about front end. Oh boy. Um, let's see. It really depends because I would say for the majority of the places that you're gonna work as, a, maybe this is a hot take. The majority of the places that you're gonna work as a front end developer it would be way better if you knew how to create performant, accessible web applications than if you knew how to do complex data structures and algorithms. Now, the caveat there is for the really large tech companies, if you're working on the back end or like the front of the back end, right, um, you might still need to know how to do these things. And they're commonly in the outdated coding interview process. But in general, I think the web would be a lot better off if we spent less time reinventing the wheel with crazy algorithms and we instead said, nope, here's how you do it. It's okay if I have to Google how to do inverting a binary tree or whatever crazy interview questions they have nowadays. And instead I focused on creating these accessible performant applications. So that's my, that's my hot take. <laughs> we gotta get Oprah in here and just throwing out, you get a shirt and you get a shirt. Uh, let's see. <laughs> AVIF. Okay. AVIF. What is happening with React Server Components in the Next.js space? So we're working closely with the React team to integrate this into Next.js. Next.js will be the probably the first framework that has support for this. So basically stay tuned. Hopefully that happens sooner than later, but we'll see. It's still in the RFC phase. Thank you so much, Pedro. I appreciate it. Is it important to have a good background in Create React app before migrating to Next.js? Um, I would say no. I think that it's good to have a base level of React knowledge, whether you want to use any of the React frameworks. But I've, you know, I've been making educational content around Next.js and React, and I found that I've been able to educate people who are React beginners entirely, starting with Next.js. And part of the reason for that is there are parts of the React ecosystem that you might need to learn when you get more advanced. But when you're getting started, I, I really truly believe that the best thing is seeing like incremental progress. Like it's really deflating to try to learn and hit error after error and not actually get something built. Like as, as I'm learning new things, the most uh, inspiring and exciting thing is when you com it compiles, right? It runs, like my code runs. So that's why I think I've I've seen good success actually teaching people Next.js by default because the amount of configuration or code needed to just get a hello world application 
is really, really low. And then with React Fast Refresh, which makes it like instant basically when you save and you update your page, it gives people that wow factor of like, oh wow, like I just you know changed my HTML and I see it update on the screen. And I think that incremental progress helps keep, keep people interested and wanting to learn more. And th this is my personal philosophy. Like if I'm not, uh, if I'm not interested in learning anything, then I would just get burnt out. Like I have to be somewhat interested in learning this stuff or it'd just be kind of a slog. So I think it's important to, to really try to keep that interest at heart. Um, use your video for fonts today where it's like a charm. Thank you very much. Um, on my YouTube channel, there's a video about performant web font loading with the best practices for 2021. Check that out if you want to learn more. <laughs> Our React server component something real, or was it just a joke on Twitter? I don't know. The verdict's still out. I think the React team, they did release it around Christmas. So it's possible that it was just a prank. I mean, we, we don't know yet. <laughs> I'm kidding, by the way. Um, can we place authentication in front of a Next.js app and not within the app? Yes, you could do authentication at the um, at a higher level up in the stack, basically. So you could have uh, an authentication layer in front of your Next.js application if, if you really want it to. Any generic resources or migration guides for moving existing React apps to Next.js? So I have a blog post that we can put in the chat um, about incremental adoption of Next.js, which outlines a few different strategies for how you can load that content. That's one piece. Um, I'm working on adding migration guides for all the different places you might be coming from in the documentation. So one for Gatsby is already there. Um, as mentioned previously, one for Create React App and React Router will be here soon. And if you're still stuck, feel free to DM me and we can try to figure something out. Lots of good questions. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Really appreciate it. LCP, largest contemple paint. Yep, that's another another core web vital. This is a fun one. What do I think about the no code movement? Um, maybe more hot takes. Stay tuned for all the hot takes. I think that no code and low code tools are fantastic, but but at the end of the day, um, no code can be fundamentally limiting at a certain scale. So I think no code is great for getting people into the technology or development space who might not have the time or the resources to kind of learn more about it, but it introduces a little bit of friction down the road. Um, I, there was just uh, like something that was popular on Twitter a few days ago. It was like an old Steve Jobs video where he was talking about how like the best code is the code that you don't write. Like you want to prevent writing 80% of the code. And the the key thing there is 80%. So you want to abstract away 80%, but at the end, you probably still need to have that 20% of the glue code to like hook up your different pieces together. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of innovation and a lot of excitement in this space. That's why I prefer to say like, I would go all in on low code, not necessarily no code. I think no code is still a little ways out, but low, like I, I view web view, or web flow as kind of like low code. Like you still need to understand CSS a little bit when you're using web flow. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of my take. Yeah, I was talking about analytics earlier. Thanks to Hanker Christina, who is in the chat, dropping all the links. Um, let's see. I wonder what next JS 11 will be like. Me too. I have no idea. <laughs> we'll see. I'm sure it'll be great. Lots of new features. I don't know when it'll be out, but <laughs> stay tuned. Um, Best resources for state management in React. Um, there was recently a state management series on egghead.io 
um, just talking about all the different options in state management. There's like a million different state state management libraries today. Um, and it really depends on the type of application that you're building. You can get, I don't want people to get upset, but you can get pretty far using like a React, uh, React context and a use reducer or something like that. I know that people argue that React context isn't really state management, but it really, it really depends on what you're trying to build. Like when you're trying to do, if you're trying to build Figma, right? Like you're not gonna be able to use React context and use reducer in a performant manner. That's when you probably lean for some of those external libraries. Hmm. Why is Next.js providing special support for Tailwind CSS? Is there special benefits of using it? Um, really the reason why we started a Tailwind RFC for um, integrated support into Next.js, primarily because we saw a ton of people who were using Tailwind with Next.js. So we just wanna make that developer experience as smooth as possible. And are there any special benefits of using it? One of the nice things I like about Tailwind that I feel like I don't see people talk about as much, which is Tailwind's awesome for like the utility classes and quickly building UIs and all that stuff. But the cool thing is your set of utility classes, it is constant. If you build a hundred thousand pages in your application or something ridiculous, right? You're never going to probably, like you can build an application where you don't need anything more than those utility classes. When you compare that against, if you were doing something where, especially when you have like disparate teams working on an application where you have to coordinate and each one adds their own styles for each page, like you're shipping so much CSS then, like every page has its own CSS. So the cool thing about utility frameworks really in general, like it's not like this is a new concept per se, but Tailwind has really, uh, simplify the DX of that um, is that you know as your application scales the the number of classes remains constant. Um, let's see. I talked a little bit about this one, but yeah, I expect that to be in the docs here very soon. Oh yeah. There's a hackathon uh, that we partnered with Hashnode and you can get some of the swag that I'm wearing. So go check that out. I think there's like a $500 prize too. So that's really cool. Is the next dark mode theme library a good option to provide theming with SAS modules? I would recommend checking out the next themes library. Uh, it's really simple easy to use API made by one of our Vercel coworkers, Paco. And yeah, should be everything you need. Uh, let's see. This has been really fun. You guys have lots of great questions. Um, hi, Lindsay, big fan, big fan. Lindsay's doing lots of great work over at Netlify. Shout out to Lindsay. Um, if anyone has new Relic integration information, please let me know. That would be great. Any downsides of using Preact with Next.js? Um, so I'm trying out Preact right now just to see how it works on my personal site to reduce some of the initial JavaScript that's sent over. The big caveat here is that we don't really know, I mean, I don't really know personally what the future of Preact's roadmap looks like, um, specifically with how they'll handle things like concurrent mode and React server components. Um, I'm not sure if those will be supported in the Preact world, and those are probably going to be things that you want to do with React. So it's maybe worth checking out, um, but as far as the future longevity goes, I'm not sure if that will align with the React core teams plans. Do I write tests? Uh, in, my, in my current role, I'm not really writing that many tests, but I have definitely used to write tests all the time. M right now, I'm mostly focused on working with the customers of Vercel and then working with the Next.js community in a DevRel aspect. But in the past, yeah, I've, I've written plenty of tests, a lot with Jest. And I also really prefer writing integration tests, um, whether that's 
Cypress or using a service like Checkly really makes life a lot easier to do it that way. How to remove unused bootstrap CSS in Next.js. That's a great question. I am not sure, but I bet you can configure purge CSS to handle that for you. Um, <laughs> where can we find your music? Um, this is random, but I'm just going to answer it. So fun fact, maybe this is like the, I, I'm working on actually recording my first music because I signed up for a music class to learn like the production of music. And that's been really fun because I've played music for a variety of years, but I've never actually like recorded something and put it out into the world that was, you know, decent quality. So I'm excited to, excited to do that. <laughs> yes, it's a brand new record. I had to get this one on eBay. <laughs> they were sold out so quick. Um, shout out to brand new. Tony, Tony Stark is in Russia. I just realized I'm like super far behind in the chat. <laughs> He's hiding out in Russia. That's really funny. Um, lots of good questions. Thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate it. Mm. Oh, yeah, this is a really good point. So you can, we're talking about directory setups. You can move the pages folder into source. So like a top level source folder is supported by default. Why is Geist UI getting so little support? So a little clarification here. There is an open source library called Geist UI that uh, one of the members of the community has made that looks similar to the Vercel design system. The good news is here, we're working on open sourcing the Vercel design system and component library. Um, we've just hired a few people who will be working on this. Super exciting. Um, I think everyone will will really enjoy that. I've been learning Next.js for a month now. What advice do you have? Keep going. Um, try to learn as much as you can, build as much as you can. For me, things really stick when I actually build actual applications, whether I'm just copying, like rebuilding twitter.com or rebuilding Expedia.com. That sounds like the most random thing. Expedia.com. Yeah. Um, rebuilding chat roulette. <laughs> I don't know. Will your recent research about font loading lead to something built in with Next.js so we don't have to do the research ourselves? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's one of the things I love the most about Next.js, which is let's figure out the best practices and the most performant ways to do things and then help more people do that so that they don't have to spend the time reinventing the wheel. So I would expect um, font optimization support to, to come to Next.js. We've experimented with this a little bit, but it was only for Google fonts. So I would expect to see this expand a bit more. <laughs> I talked about this one a little bit earlier, just um, what no code will look like, but I don't think, Anyone should be scared for their jobs if you're a coder. It's it, it it will not replace coding in any ways, and you know somebody still has to somebody still has to make Webflow.com. <laughs> That's just my opinion, though. Oh no, so many comments. Okay. Uh, are there good examples of how to retrieve your CMS content from static site generation and then use it for all your page generation? Um, so there are, I believe like eight different examples for different CMSs in the Next.js examples folder on GitHub. So basically whichever CMS you want, headless CMS, there is an example for how to use that with SSG. Would we ever get forms from Vercel to Next.js? Um, so there's a few different options for kind of how you can wire this up yourself. If you're wondering if it would ever, ever be like a built-in part of the Vercel product, maybe. Uh, it's not on our roadmap, roadmap right now, but who knows? Um, yeah, check out this web font best practices video in the meantime before this is built into Next.js. Yeah, Formium's great. Shout out to Jared for working with Forms. Yes. So does Vercel have any e-commerce partners in addition to big commerce? 
Um, we, we partner with a lot of e-commerce providers, but specifically for the Next.js commerce example, first was big commerce, next will be Shopify. And then <laughs> don't hold me to this, but I think the third one is Swell. So correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. Um, would I ever see myself moving to another framework like Vue or Svelte or just React all the way? Um, I'm pretty invested in the React ecosystem now. Vue is pretty, I mean, it really is pretty similar. I think the biggest difference for me from what I've played around with Vue a little bit and Vue experts, correct me if I'm wrong, but Vue seems more focused on the single file components uh, where it kind of everything's in an entire file. Um, but overall, I think Vue's doing a lot of things right. I think frameworks like too, like Next and Nuxt are kind of like co-inspired by each other. Um, Guillermo had a talk at a Nuxt or a Vue conference where he talked about like the the origins of Next.js and how that worked with with Nuxt too. So maybe somebody will link that. But it was it was really interesting. That predates me, so I was it was all new to me too. This is interesting because I've been thinking about building an example for this. So let me know if, if y'all would find this helpful, but how, do you know of any real world examples that are like the Vercel dashboard that are open source? Um, yeah, I would really like to build something like this because um, I think this will help for people who might have built uh, internal dashboards with a Create React app or something and they want to move over. I really want to build something like this with React server components because um, I think that that's the future of the Vercel dashboard too. <laughs> No code is just someone else's code. <laughs> That's really funny. It's true. What do you think of React as merging with Next.js? So I don't think this will really ever happen. Um, I like to think of React as the, if you think about a computer analogy, React is like the OS layer, the operating system layer. It's like the most low level one. And people can reuse React with all sorts of different backends too. Like you could serve up React from PHP backend if you wanted to. Um, so I don't think that they would ever merge, but it's nice to have different options too in the React ecosystem. Obviously I'm biased and I like using Next.js, but you know, there's gonna be in the future, some other thing that comes out that supports the new hotness or something like that, that maybe can't support Webpack. And we wanna encourage that innovation and you know help people create a performant web. So I'm biased, but yeah, I don't think that'll happen. I'd be curious if anyone has an answer to this in the chat, how to pull style components generated CSS out into its own cache. Um, this is, here's a hot take. I'm just gonna fire off some hot takes. Um, I used to love style components and it's still really good, but um, I am very enticed by like the zero runtime CSS and JS libraries because part of my job as a solutions architect now is you know working with companies and saying, hey, let me analyze the performance of your site. How can I help you make it better? And runtime CSS and JS has, uh, it affects performance more than you think. My guess is that the style components team is working on something like this. So I'm, I'm probably wrong. And maybe they already have a zero runtime solution, but um, check out uh, Stitches. Stitches is pretty cool. Oh yeah, check that out. <laughs> Recoil seems cool. I've never used it, so I can't really give a, a good opinion. This is coming. It will be here at some point. <laughs> Which database solution would you suggest using with Next.js and Vercel? It's, this is like the hardest question to answer because it really depends on what you're trying to build. Like for a lot of people, they need just something super simple. They're Front end developers getting into the back end, and you know they need something that's just easy to use and get deployed. Maybe that's Firebase, maybe that's Supabase, maybe that's Redis. Um, but maybe there's people who have a little bit more back end experience, and they like SQL, and they want to stick with SQL, and they want to do something that's more, uh, more self hosted, more I want to configure pieces. And so maybe that's uh, Postgres on RDS hosted on uh, AWS. I actually have a blog post at lerob.io um, talking about just backend 101 for front end developers. I would recommend checking that out. Can we use SWR instead of Redux? Um, 
kind of. So it's helpful to think about application state and just state management as two, well, there, there's a variety of different state management, but let's break it down into global application state and data fetching state. So global application state might be like, I have some filters on the left of my e-commerce site, and these filters are allowing me to like change which products I have shown or the prices or that, that's like your global application state, right? Um, but then you also might have some data fetching state, which there's different ways in Redux to go about this, but call some API, get that data back and cache it so you can use it in your application. SWR replaces that part of Redux. So you could still use SWR in combination with Redux for your global application state. Um, yeah. <laughs> Where was I just at? I saw somebody say Next.js underwear. <laughs> Where was that at? <laughs> now that would be something. Um, who knows? Mm, can you please tweet the blog for incremental adoption? Yeah, somebody, I think uh, the Vercel account will, will throw that in the chat. Yeah, this is a good take. Uh, headless CMS is, Next.js is kind of just agnostic to where you want to get your data, whether it's Sanity or Datto CMS or Contentful or Cosmic or there's like a million CMSs. So where, wherever you want to get it, Next.js doesn't care. What are your thoughts on TypeScript? Do you use it at work? I'm a late bloomer for the TypeScript phase. I uh, am just now getting into it. Um, I hadn't really used it in the past. I still don't use it for my personal site, but things that Vercel use it. So I've I've learned to navigate the TypeScript world a little bit better. I'm still still definitely a novice. I don't know it very well. So I'm I'm excited to learn more about that. If you have good TypeScript resources, I would be interested in checking those out because definitely a novice. Hmm. <laughs> no about the underwear. That's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> deploy Next.js in Vercel versus Kubernetes. Thoughts, please. Um, I was talking about this a little bit earlier with self-hosting documentation. So technically, you can deploy Next.js with Kubernetes. You can have multi-zone replication. You can do all of the crazy hotness with Kubernetes that I probably don't know about. I've I've used it before, but imagine me like typing in commands on the terminal, like desperately trying not to screw something up with kubectl. I think people are like contested about how you pronounce that, whether it's kubectl or something else. Um, but you you absolutely can build this all yourself. What we found is like a lot of the people who are interested in Next.js. They want to have a scalable application and they really just don't want to think about the infrastructure. There are going to be backend devs who love that stuff and they want to hand roll all their infrastructure. They want to work with Kubernetes. They want to host on AWS themselves. You know, there, there's a place for those people too. I think the majority of people, in my opinion, um, can just use Vercel and it, it saves them a lot of time. Best advice for somebody that's not a developer by trade, but has a good understanding of some of the techniques and that wants to build stuff efficiently and stay up to date with what's happening in this world. Um, well, a shameless self plug, but I have a free course called react2025.com. And I've heard from quite a few people who weren't developers who's taken it and they learned a lot and they learned about some of the new features of Next.js and how to actually build a real world application. Um, yeah, check that out. You might enjoy it. There is an example in the Next.js repo for using Apollo server-side rendered with uh, Next.js. Let's check that out. Uh, Firebase admin and Next.js API or Firebase on the client. I think that both have a place. So the nice thing about Firebase admin is when you have that set up, not only can you use it in API routes, but you can also use it for static site generation. So when you're in get static props or get server side props, those are, you're running Node.js code. So you can use Firebase admin there to query all the products in your database or something and statically generate those pages. And going even a little bit further, you can do incremental static regeneration there as well too. So that, excuse me, that's also in my React 2025 course, which is free. 
here's a few options for zero runtime CSS and JS libraries. There was, so I've never seen people complain that Next.js doesn't suit their use case. Do you have any use cases where it's not the best option? So Jeff from HashiCorp had a talk at Next.js Conf called when not to use Next.js. And he covered this pretty well. So I would recommend checking that out. It's on the Vercel YouTube channel under the Next.js conference playlist. <laughs> Why is it called Next.js? I'm I'm pretty sure in that video I talked about that Guillermo did at the VIEW conference or whatever, it talked about this a little bit on why it's called Next.js. That's a good question though, I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, somebody has the Next.js Twitter. Uh, it's really funny when people accidentally tag it. I don't think I don't think we're gonna get it. Twitter's really weird about how they like release, yeah, even if a, an account isn't active, there's still, it's hard to hard to get usernames. If it was that easy, I would have at Lee Rob, but some guy in Great Britain has it, I think. <laughs> Lots of people love TypeScript. TypeScript fanboy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. GraphQL request is by Prisma, not Formidable. I think, I swear that Formidable had something with GraphQL, but oh, <laughs> answered all my questions. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Formula Labs has Urkel, which is another one. When do I think I'll release another course like React 2025? Um, potentially this year. I'm putting some thoughts together for what that next course might look like. Haven't really decided exactly what it's going to be yet. Um, let me know if you have suggestions. Yeah, Nextra, um, really cool project. Um, it's a really easy way to do a doc site, um, like the swr.vercel.app site uses this. Um, check that out if you want to build like a doc site or there's even a blog template you can use too. So it, it basically just simplifies using MDX with, with Next. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Hmm. <laughs> I'm assuming this was about the, the Kubernetes comments. Yeah, I, I'm a Kubernetes novice. I've only used it when I was like in my, my prior job and I was trying to figure out how things were deployed. We were deploying Next.js on Kubernetes and I did like kubectl into the pods and like restart the pods and I don't know. I was way over my head, I'm not gonna lie. Next course will be <laughs> Next.js 2030. Yeah, if you know if Next.js is still kicking in 2030, then I think we did a good job. That would be a very long, long-lived framework. That'd be great. It's crazy that React has been around for so long. I think it was 2014. Correct me if I'm wrong. When React came out, but yeah, and it's it's still like getting more popular every day, which is which is pretty nuts. <laughs> React 7070 is going to be crazy. I'm finally caught up in the chat answering them in real time. It's amazing. Um, you can check Web Vitals with Next.js Analytics. Um, yeah, so if you want to do like a one-off test of the performance of your website, you can run Google Lighthouse in Chrome. Um, but if you want feedback over time, you can use Next.js Analytics, which is built into Vercel. There's a free tier too, so you can use it on a on a hobby account if you'd like on your personal account. Um, and you can also use this if you're not deployed to Vercel too. So if you are self-hosted at Apple or something, which Apple uses Next.js. So if you're from Apple watching this and you wanna use Next.js Analytics, just send me a DM and I'll help you out. Um, yeah. Yeah, the name with 2025 was like, I wanted it to inspire people to think about the future of how we might be building these applications, which I'm not even so much thinking about Next.js or React, which I do think that they'll still be popular then. Um, it was more about like the focus on static sites as an output. Um, I think that it's kind of contested right now, like the pendulum of between static sites and dynamic sites, whether they're server rendered sites, especially with 
with server-side rendering coming out and then some other frameworks in the space also doing more things on the server. But I think that there's still a lot of valid use cases for static for certain applications, especially if you're using something like incremental static regeneration, which allows you to still keep some of the dynamic functionality of that. But yeah, it is. it has been really interesting to see the pendulum back on the server a little bit because there's just certain things that are better on the server and the server is made to do like serving up that presentational content. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you want to learn more about what I talked about, check out versell.com slash analytics. Lots of good stuff there. With that, we... So I said I was going to talk for an hour. It's been an hour 20. Um, Y'all have had some excellent questions. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a blast hanging out with everybody today. Anything about Vercel and Next.js, um, I really appreciate y'all hanging out with me today and learning more. <laughs> Hopefully I answered your questions and maybe gave you some new things to check out. So let me know if you'd wanna see another AMA like this. We might be doing these on a more regular basis just to hear what the community is interested in, hear what you want us to work on. Um, feel free to check me out on Twitter, send me a message, anything Next.js or Vercel related. So thank you all so much. With that, that kind of concludes our stream today. Um, yeah, thanks everyone.